So the heat pulse of second sound creates a pulse-like change in the resistance of the disc up here. It isn't hard to convert this resistance pulse into a voltage pulse. What we will do is to maintain a small DC current in the top resistor. It is supplied from a battery in this metal box. The box shields the circuit in order to reduce electronic noise. The voltage pulse is small. In this second box, we have an amplifier. The amplifier output is fed into the oscilloscope where it will appear on the upper trace. The horizontal time scale on this trace is exactly the same as for the bottom trace. However, the upper trace records voltage changes as they occur in the top resistor, the detector of second sound. The temperature of the liquid is about 1.65 degrees Kelvin. battery has been turned on. And now the amplifier. Among noise and other distortions in the upper trace, a clear-cut voltage pulse appears, about four and a half units to the right, four and a half milliseconds later than the pulse entering the heater. This pulse in the upper trace is also about one millisecond long. It is the second sound as it arrives at the upper resistor. The upper trace also shows a strong voltage pulse at the left, simultaneous with the heater pulse. That's due to pickup by electromagnetic wave with the heater acting as transmitter and the detector as receiver. We are moving the detector towards the heater. The pulse moves with it to the left. Notice the echoes of second sound which appear on the upper trace while the detector is near the heater. They are caused by multiple reflection between the two resistors. A total of three echoes is clearly visible. Moving the detector away from the heater increases the delay. Here we have the resistors at their original distance again. They are nine centimeters apart. The wave of second sound covers nine centimeters in four and a half milliseconds. The speed of second sound is two centimeters per millisecond, or 2,000 centimeters per second, or 20 meters per second. Let me return to the discussion of the two fluid model for liquid helium-2 we find that it gives us an adequate qualitative description for the behavior of helium-2. The superfluid component is frictionless and free of entropy. It is thought to be the part of helium-2 which leaks through the finest pores, which rises up toward the source of heat in the fountain effect, and which creeps up along the walls of the container. The normal component, on the other hand, is viscous and possesses some available heat energy. The normal component is thought to be that part of helium-2 which is dragged along by the rotating cylinder and which remains behind in the beaker with a porous bottom unless it is first converted to the superfluid component. Now, a model alone is not a theory. It turns out that quantum mechanics has had to be brought to bear on the problem of producing an accurate check between theory and experiment. As is usual, when we attempt to explain a quantum mechanical system by a classical model, this model gets lost, becomes washed out, so to speak. It's there, but then again it isn't. The model is false, but many of its elements survive. That's what has happened to the two-fluid model for liquid helium-2. Helium-2 must now be considered as a quantum mechanical system. It is still true that helium-2 is capable of two different types of motion, but we cannot anymore claim that these two motions occur on different parts of the liquid or on different groups of helium atoms. 
Rather, we should look at it all as one liquid system capable of two different types of motions simultaneously. The superfluid motion, a perfect fluid flow, reversible in the thermodynamic sense, and the normal motion, a viscous flow, either laminar or turbulent, and irreversible. <laughs>